if you are over 50, you know about it. If you are under 50, you've heard about it. What? That the first day of the week has greatly diminished as regards its status in civilization. When I was a boy, I remember about the age of nine or ten, planning to hide my shoes so I wouldn't be dragged off to church. But I usually failed. And when I got to the High Church of England, Anglican Church, the only thing I could read was the Book of Common Prayer, which is a very wonderful book, but it didn't have a lot of attraction for a boy of nine or ten. But in later years, after having come to Sydney, on Saturday I would go to a theatre, movie theatre in the morning, another one in the afternoon, then a newsreel in the evening. Saturday was a great day for recreation. But Sunday I was still dragged to church. Years later, between flights, I decided to go into the city and see what Sydney looked like now. I was surprised. The big stores were open on Sunday, because this was Sunday. And there were notices up in many places, open seven days. Something had happened. And as Sunday lost its significance, the number of Christians have diminished in the world. Now, a little while ago, the BBC put out an article how Sunday school shaped Great Britain. This article, I'll give you the date of it, the 3rd of the 7th, 2008, this article said that millions of boys and girls in the first part of the 20th century and certainly in the 19th century loved Sunday school because they sang and they heard stories and many of them learned to read at Sunday school. So that's a great article. But that's not the way it is today. Sunday has lost its significance. When Elton Trueblood, a very wonderful scholar of last century, discussed the matter, he said it's because of increasing secularization of society. God is dead to many people, or he's behind the door. He's not to be bothered about. No need to worship. And True Blood said, accompanying this loss of worship time on Sunday has been increase in divorce. He said those two commandments in the Decalogue, the fourth and the fifth, one about worship on the Sabbath day and the other about the sacredness of the family, he said when they go, civilization begins to disintegrate. You would be surprised at the number of very great people who've taken the same position as True Blood. James Orr, who lived a bit before True Blood, said the fourth commandment is the protective shield over both tables of the door. Protects the first commandments, which are all about worship, who to worship, how to worship, the approach of worship, the time of worship. That's the first table. But then comes the second table about the family, sacredness of life, purity, telling the truth, not coveting. Said James Orr, it's the fourth commandment that shelters all these. And when the fourth commandment goes, the other commandments begin to integrate and civilization begins to die.
Now I'll give you a name you know better. Karl Barth, thought of as the greatest theologian of the 20th century. I was amazed at what he wrote in his Church Dogmatics. I think it was volume three. He claimed that the fourth commandment was the most important of the ten. That it was a sign of being a true Christian. And he said, when it's neglected, civilization will fold up and the demons will rule. Well, that's very strong. Of course, a hundred years before Bart, Dwight L. Moody said, when the Sabbath is neglected, the family goes down. And when the family goes down, the nation goes down. John Calvin, centuries before, said something like that as well. Why are these good men so wrapped up in a command about going to church and keeping a day holy? Well, let me remind you, the word worship is an abridgment of worth-ship, W-O-R-T-H. In other words, only in God do we find out what has true value. Now, you can live like a river or you can live like a swamp. What do I mean? Rivers have banks. They have limitations. Swamps flow out everywhere. Do you understand what I am saying? In the New Testament, Paul writes, the love of Christ constrains me, narrows me, limits me. The real test of true living is to know what to leave out and what to include. 80% of things we do only have 20% of importance. 20% of the things we do, like looking after the family and your health, they have 80% importance. So the test of character is to know what is the 20%. Only a person who worships God is able to distinguish between the important and the unimportant. And yet men for thousands of years have seen the necessity of doing that. Seneca, Roman philosopher, he said most people only live for a few surges of moments or minutes. The rest of their life is wasted. The rest of their life evaporates. They don't know how to distinguish between the important and the unimportant. Most great thinkers have agreed with Seneca. Let me point out to you, there are only two thou shalts in the Ten Commandments. A little boy said, the Ten Commandments, that's the list of things you mustn't do. Well, that's not quite true. There are two things you must do. There are two thou shalts, and there are eight thou shalt nots. The two thou shalts come from the beginning of time, when God made the world and set aside the seventh day as a sign that he was the creator and that he'd made everything. But at the same time, he instituted marriage. So the Sabbath and marriage came in at the beginning of time. And they're the two positive commandments, the Sabbath and the family, in the Decalogue. From them flow all the others. Because of the family, life is sacred, so thou shalt do no murder. Because of the family, purity is sacred. Thou shalt not commit adultery. In the family, we learn about property being sacred. Thou shalt not steal. And we learn to tell the truth. Thou shalt not bear false witness. And the root of all wrong thinking, all wrong doing, is wrong thinking. So thou shalt not covet. But all those last ones, they come out of the family. That's where we learn what is good and what is right, and what is pure. Once the Sabbath and the family are neglected, morality goes out the door gradually. Flowers that are plucked don't die immediately. It takes a little while. 
our generation lacks commitment. Maybe the next generation will go to the asylum. Will Durant, that very wonderful historian, said there's never been an example where a secular state could maintain morality without religious faith. That's important. May I underline that the Ten Commandments can be read more than one way. If you're a Christian, you don't read any negatives. You read it like this. Thou shalt not murder, because you're a believer. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not commit false witness. In other words, the commandments become promises if you are a believer. I'm trying to suggest to you that the deterioration of Sunday is the beginning of the deterioration of morality and civilization. Of course, it's already begun. We kill over 50 million children every year by abortion, some of which are legitimate, the rest are only convenient. Wars, in 3,500 years of war, there are only 270 years of peace. But such is our culture, more men die by automobiles, car accidents than in war. We live in a dangerous world. And a world without God is teetering towards its end. I would like to point out to you that great scholars have said again and again and again, you cannot have a balanced good life without the worship of God. James Morrison, who was a wonderful Christian commentator, when he wrote on Matthew 24, 20, where Jesus, talking about the flight from Jerusalem, AD 70, when the Romans were about to destroy it, he said, pray your flight be not on the Sabbath day. I'd like to read you, if I can find it, what Morrison said about that comment. Listen, this is what James Morrison his commentary on Matthew 24, 20, pray your flight, be not on the Sabbath day. He was not anticipating a new state of things in which there'd be no Sabbath day, whatever, by no means. It would be very far from desirable in the present condition of human nature that our week should be without their special day of solemn pause. It would be sad indeed if the world's worry were to go on uninterruptedly, especially amid the competitive forces and consequent fastness of commercial and highly civilised communities. It would be spiritually and morally and even physically disastrous if amid the continual stretching and straining toward earth and earth's things, there were no periodical parentheses of seasons frequently occurring, occurring during which the worldly bow might be unbent and the thoughts and energies of the mind turned systematically upward and heavenward. What a great and sensible comment. You know, they say about Mozart, if he hadn't taken time off to get away from his work, he'd have gone mad. He'd become a lunatic. Jesus Christ said, enter in at the narrow gate. Broad is the way, wide is the gate, at least is destruction. But small is the gate, and narrow is the path that leads to life. And that's not just talking about going to heaven, that's about how to live. Have you ever noticed that the word evil, E-V-I-L, is the word live, spelled backwards? Whatever God commands, life commends. 
To do good is good for you. Doing evil is the parent of disaster and misery. Doing good is the parent of happiness. May I point out to you that when we look at the dissolution of Sunday and we are amazed, we should keep in mind that there's not one verse in the Bible that says we should keep Sunday as a holy day. We thought of it as a holy day that's now become a holiday. But in the Bible, the first day of the week is never a sacred day. Well, I remember a great evangelist advertised one of his meetings, a thousand dollars for one text. Anyone who could come up with a text that said you should go to church on Sunday would get the thousand dollars. He remained a comparatively wealthy man. He never lost it. Today there are about a hundred small denominations that take the fourth commandment very seriously. They go back to the Seventh-day Baptists who existed for centuries. Very wonderful people, included many great scholars. But today there are about a hundred small denominations. There's one denomination that's the fifth largest Protestant denomination that takes the fourth commandment seriously. That's the Seventh-day Adventist Church. They've done it for over 150 years, taking the Bible at its value. But unfortunately, that same church has dabbled in date setting, dates like 1844 and 457 and 5387. None of these are in the Bible. There's not the slightest evidence for any of them. None of them. And Christ forbade date calculation. He said, it's not for you to set the dates. Read Acts 1 and verse 7. Well, these small denominations, and they're about a hundred, there's a book called Handbook of Sabbath-Keeping Denomination that lists them all. They believe that the seventh day of the week is the true rest day because it is the blessed day. The Bible says God blessed it and set it, set it apart, sanctified it. So they read it, believe it's the rest day, the blessed day, therefore the best day. But they also believe, many of them, that it is the test day. What do I mean by that? Well, if you read Exodus 16, it's about the manna, You'll read that God said to the Israelites, God has given you this Sabbath to test you whether you'll walk in his law or not. KJV says to prove you. means the same thing. If you read Jeremiah 17, God said to Israel, if you keep the Sabbath, Jerusalem will stand forever. If you don't, Jerusalem and the temple will be burnt to ashes. They didn't, and it happened. When you come to the first chapter in the New Testament that mentions the Sabbath, and the Sabbath is mentioned more times in the New Testament proportionately than in the Old, about 60 times, you always read of Christ's followers keeping it. Read the last verse of Luke 23. Christ kept it in life and death. It's kept throughout the book of Acts. It's never taken away. If a law is rescinded, it has to be rescinded with the same noise and proclamation as it was given. There's only one negative text about the Sabbath, that's Colossians 2.16. But the context talks about human traditions, people who are keeping holy days by fasting and having dreams about angels. But Matthew 12 was the first chapter in the New Testament. And it's a wonderful chapter. In that chapter, Christ says that he's greater than the temple. The temple, 50 years been building. And here's a Nazarene claiming to be greater than the temple. He goes on to say he's greater than Jonah. He's greater than the prophets. What? Greater than Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, this man from Bethlehem, this peasant, this carpenter. Who does he think he is? He says, I'm God. So I'm greater than the temple. 
I'm the son of God. I'm greater than all the prophets. Then he says, greater than Solomon is here. So he's greater than the kings. What a man. Greater than the temple. Greater than the prophets. Greater than the kings. And then he says, and I'm Lord even of the Sabbath. That makes the day pretty important, doesn't it? Now let me point out to you that all the outward Christian observances like baptism, Lord's Supper, or Sabbath keeping, they all have a deep spiritual meaning. There's no spiritual virtue in putting your feet up and doing nothing all day on the Sabbath day. The physical rest is a sign of rest of heart. In the verses just before the chapter I've quoted, Jesus says, Come unto me, all ye that labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. There is the meaning of the fourth commandment. As we study that law, we learn how to live. So life is like a river and not a swamp. You know, some people's minds are so wide open, they can't even keep one conviction. Their lives are messy. Successful people are people who know how to narrow their lives within banks. Enter in the narrow gate, says Jesus. But the meaning of that rest, that physical rest, that's necessary so you have time to worship and think about spiritual things, the meaning is it's a symbol of the rest of heart, the rest of mind. Because when you find Christ, you lose your guilt. You know one reason lots of people are sick? Because they're guilty because they're terribly uncertain about their future. But when you come to Christ, all that's taken away. He takes your sins, he took them to the cross. You'll never see them again. Symbolically, he said he cast them in the depths of the sea. And he gives you his righteousness. Can't earn it. It's too valuable for that, but you can take it as a gift empty hands, and that's the way to heaven. You know, only God has given away. Only heaven can be had for the asking. So the meaning of the fourth commandment with its physical rest, giving people an opportunity to worship, is the rest of heart that is yours the moment you stop trusting in yourself and your deeds, good or bad, and instead you trust in the finished work of Christ, who on the cross could say, it's finished, he'd redeemed the world. By the sin of one, condemnation came upon all men. But by the obedience of one, Jesus, justification, righteousness, came upon all men. The whole world's been redeemed, but you must accept it. Dear friend, have you shared your problems and accepted the rest that is in Jesus Christ. If not, I pray you will do it today. God bless you. I should have mentioned I have written this book, The Forgotten Day, on this topic, and it's available through Amazon.